Good afternoon, Team Mead. I appreciate any of you that are joining us here today. Before I kick it off too much, uh, I do want to start with we recognize that we are having some Wi-Fi and connectivity issues. So if the live stream is remotely choppy, whether in sound or video, just know that we are doing a recording that we will also end up posting tomorrow uh, on Facebook. So we will have a clean copy. Uh, if you want to bear with us today, uh, I wish you all the luck and please post in the comments any questions that you may have. So hopefully by now you know me as Colonel Michael Sapp, Garrison Commander. And today we're doing it a little bit different for this month. I specifically asked my staff to help us set up because I wanted to, one, get out a little bit more from behind the typical desks, but also to try and show off some of the personnel, the support staff we have, as well as the locations. So for the first one of these, I think it's appropriate that we do the newest of the buildings that we have for the Fort Meade Garrison family, and that is the General Joseph E. Kuhn Hall Education and Resiliency Center. And so I, I don't want to spoil the surprise, so I will kick it off to our special guest, first with Rodney, who will tell you on the education side as, of this building and what we have. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Rodney Anderson. Uh, and I am the Education Services Specialist here um, at Coon Hall, um, the Education Resiliency Center. It's great. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about our programs. Uh, we are thrilled to be in this building. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, we're here to provide a great service opportunities for service members, uh, for their family members, dependents, and the children. Um, some of the opportunities we have, uh, a definite is we will talk about tuition assistance, uh, college education, continuing education. Uh, we talk about credential assistance, um, and anything that deals with education purposes, we're here to provide that type of service. Uh, of course, we're in this new FY right now, so we're, 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 we're working with a bunch of different TARs, uh, tuition assistance requests. Uh, any service member have issues with those, definitely bring those to us to continue your education. Um, we have two colleges in the building. We have University of Maryland Global Campus is in the building. Uh, also, we have Anna Arundel Community College also in the building. Um, and on a visiting basis, we have AMU, American Military University. And they're here on Thursdays, uh, at least once a month. Um, and you can come in and, and, and set up a meeting with the college's reps. Um, we also have some classrooms upstairs where, we, where we'll be hosting um, classes in the future um, in the afternoon, in the evening time with Anne Arundel Community College and also with University of Global Campus. Um, those courses are already on the schedule for them. Um, just kind of link into their link to their website and you can find out what courses they have available. One of the biggest things that we do here in this education center is with our young soldiers, and it will be our BSEP program, Basic Skills Education Program. Uh, that program is designed to help our service members increase their GT scores um, so they can further their military careers by doing great things, going off to recruiting school, drill sergeant school, uh, change the MOS, deciding to go to OCS or ROTC. They will have to increase their scores if they do not have that 110. So we do have a BSEP program. Um, in person, right in this building, um, we have a schedule for the whole physical year. Um, the class runs about 15 days. Um, so that program is, is one of our number one priorities in this building after it comes after the education of a TA. Uh, so we promote that program. Um, you will see some of the information posted throughout the base um, on top of some of the things we do with credentials. Excellent. Now, and uh, I know you used the word service members several times. Uh, this is not just an Army facility, right? No, this is not just an Army facility. I mean, we're here to service the whole community. You walk into this building at any given time, we're able to serve as long as you have ID and you have ID to get into the base. Uh, it's open to the dependents, um, to family members, uh, DOD contractors, uh, GS workers. We're here to serve the community. Yes, sir. Now, I know we have a couple specific universities, uh, advanced institutions that have a presence here. Uh, routinely. Uh, do you know which ones those are offhand? We have the University of Maryland Global Campus. Here. They have a staff of about five people. And we have Endo, a rental community concert. Um, they have staff of about two people. And for any of you out there that are older like me, uh, University of Maryland University College is now the 
University of Maryland Global Campus because I remember the first deployment I did in Macedonia as part of the K-4 rotation in 2000 that UMUC was there. They had an office, so it's great to see that come back around full circle for me. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks. And so the other half, we call this the Education and Resiliency Center, and education is absolutely a critical part of resiliency, of building up and helping people grow and develop so that they are more prepared to handle life's challenges. Uh, but the other half of that is, of this building, is the resiliency side. And one portion, but a huge portion of that resiliency, we've got Mr. Furlano, our ACS chief, who will talk on that piece. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Good afternoon, Fort Meade and Fort Meade fans. Uh, my name is Dan Furlano. I'm the director of Army Community Service. And uh, talk to you a little bit about the resilient services that we provide through uh, Coon Hall Education and Resilience Center. Uh, we have a full-time staff member here uh, whenever the building's open. That staff member can connect anybody to services on or off post, either at the fam Fleet and Family Support Center, the Military and Family Readiness Center, which used to be the Airmen and Family Readiness Center, uh, or at DHR, at the D Director of Human Resources, or at Kimbro, or at the library in Severn. Uh, whatever the services are, customer is looking for, our folks can connect. Form handoff to make sure that we send you to some place uh, that still does what we said they do. So uh, we'll make a phone call before we say, uh, go see Mr. Jones in, in this building. We'll make sure Mr. Jones is still in that building, so when you look for him, you'll find him. Have you seen that's ever happened before? Uh, I've heard stories, <laughs> sir. <I laughs> Just maybe. Know. Yeah, problem. <laughs> so uh, and so the, the other important piece of, of that is you may not even know exactly what you're looking for, but you know, uh, you want to answer a question about how do I, uh, where do we, who does, we can help you answer all those questions uh, with our ACS specialist here in the building. The other staff member that's uh, headquartered out of this building is the Military Family Life Council. Uh, and so we call those uh, MFLEX uh, for short. Uh, they have a private office here. But there's no change in the way they have deliver, they deliver services. Uh, they will still meet you in a uh, nondescript location. Uh, can't come to your home, of course, but if you want to meet at Starbucks or in Berber Park and talk, well, the MFLIC is there for you. And uh, they do short-term, solution-focused counseling. Uh, they do have a duty to warn, so uh, if anyone uh, and they brief this duty uh, at the beginning of any encounter. So uh, if anyone says uh, anything about harming themselves or someone else, that, of course, will trigger the duty to warn. Other than that, uh, there's no records, there's no notes, there's no institutional environment, just somebody to talk to to help you get through a solution to a particular problem. And so uh, we have two here at Fort Leonard Wood, I'm sorry, at uh, Fort Meade, and... Uh, uh, one is headquartered out of this building, the other is headquartered out of family advocacy. Now, what's important about having education and resilience together is that, as, as the Colonel mentioned, education is professional resilience. It's career resilience. But you do that through skill set. And so Army Community Service provides other skills, life skills, that help us address the rough spots in our life so that we can build those skills and, therefore, our challenges actually are less frequent and less severe because we have the tools to, to deal with those challenges, whether they be financial literacy, parenting skills, uh, healthy relationship skills, all those things are available uh, through ACS. And that way, survive uh, in situations rather than merely survive it, okay, I got through it. Uh, there's actually resources to help us all thrive through that. And so. Uh, that go on here. Are, uh, are, there are classrooms available for people to uh, reserve, and they reserve it through the education services uh, technician. And uh, so if you have a unit, a soldier and family readiness group, a, uh, a club or organization that wants to meet for trainings, classes, or uh, meetings, uh, there is space available to do that here. Uh, you just need to make the reservation. There's also a demonstration kitchen. So folks could actually come in and have cooking classes, or uh, a unit could have uh, uh, training to teach uh, service members how to 
how to prepare nutritional meals in the barracks. Uh, the other thing, it could support those other meetings, training, soldier family readiness groups. Now the kitchen's a carry in and carry out. So everything you bring, you've got to leave with you. Uh, and so it, We don't but, want any mice in this no, building. No, nope. no, sir. And uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's outfitted with, uh, with uh, tableware, plates, flatware, uh, pots and pans, there's a, a two microwaves, there's a, a full-size refrigerator. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a great place. So uh, if you need a place to have a meeting, a training, or a class, uh, Coon Hall Education and Resilience Center is a great place to take advantage of. Uh, it's a beautiful spot, uh, and it's a, it's, I think it's going to be a great resource uh, for education and resilience uh, as we move fo forward into the future. Well, and I appreciate you bringing up the kitchen. I was really worried you weren't going to say a thing about it. When, and the reason that, for those that know, it's fu it is funny. I, trust me. No, the reason it's funny is that this building is the, uh, the result of 11 years worth of work and coordination. It's a result of over $5 million worth of investment by external to DOD government uh, personal commercial, political resources that weren't Department of Defense. We were gifted the renovation of this building for the sake of education and resiliency, uh, which is a fascinating story. But as I got to be the lucky garrison commander who just happens to be here at the, at the 11th year when we get to open it, what I found out time and again is despite the number of, right, you have that many years to decide what's going to go into such a building. The kitchen is the only thing that was mentioned on day one that is still here on day 11 times 365. So it, it would not, uh, it would, this would not have been a successful encounter if we hadn't brought it up. So I appreciate that. And for on the off chance, anyone, we do have a live audience ish. I say ish because it's a small group of five, but I, and I really appreciate the attendance. Any barracks individuals? Okay. So I, the reason I, bring it up as I hear this flack from some of our single soldiers when I bring up the cooking kitchen because they still can't have hot plates in a lot of case. But it is part of the Army's plan to have cooktop counters in every barracks room. Now that's in FY 28-29, so that's a few years, and most of our single soldiers probably won't be single by that time. But uh, you can be excited that maybe your kids, when they uh, enlist and come here, that they'll have that opportunity and the classes to go with it. So thank you. I also want to give my personal um, support, I guess, to the IMFLEC uh, process. For those that haven't, haven't used it, I'm also a fan of the military one source that you can call and say, hey, I need counseling. I need to talk to an expert. <clears throat> military one source is a phenomenal tool, and it's always there. It's uh, 800 number away. The inflex are the face-to-face -face version of that because sometimes it's not enough to talk to someone on a phone when you're in crisis that you need somebody you can talk to. The beauty is exactly what Mr. Ferlano said. There's no notes. There's no record. So any, especially in our um, population that we have here, there's no, no reports that end up on your SF-86 because you've been receiving professional treatment. It's not treatment. It is a chance to talk to someone who has the education the credentials and the understanding and knowledge to just hear you out. And it's almost like an ER triage where they could say, nope, you need to talk to someone on a more consistent level. You need to engage differently. I can help you through this immediate near-term issue, but we can get you to the next level. Uh, but sometimes that's all we need is just to talk. And based on whether it's the jobs that we have that people don't understand, uh, single service members, if you're living in the barracks and you're not even allowed to have an animal to talk to in the afternoon, it's just someone else that you can connect with that can hear you out. The last point when we talk resiliency is the idea that it, I grew up where resiliency meant the ability to bounce back. That's a great quick catchphrase, right? You take the hit, you get knocked down, that's okay, you jump right back up. But there's another aspect that you mentioned that made me think of this. It's not just the bounce back. It's be able to dodge left and right so you never get hit in the first place. Right. And that's that preparation. But if you don't invest now into financial management, parenting classes, when the kid has been screaming for the last four hours and you don't know what to do, 
it's already too late. Sometimes we've got to put that work in ahead of time to create the resiliency that allows us to operate at our optimal method. Right. We don't want to, we don't want our resilience tanks to be uh, emptied out too quickly. Right. Because uh, that's, and that's what happens when we find ourselves at wit's end. Sure. So the other thing that's unique about Coon Hall, before I go into some other more generic um, Fort Meade topics that we wanted to hit, is, as I mentioned, the fundraising and support. So what you see behind me, camera, although it wasn't intentional, it just works out because this really is the best angle in the room. But that's our sponsorship wall. And it's not every day that you get to go into a government facility and see a sponsor wall. But why this is relevant is that I think it's really important to remember that uh, a lot of these are part of the Fort Meade Alliance. They have, they gathered a lot of the effort that goes into this, but they weren't truly alone because no one's part of just one group. Uh, they, they connected a lot of resources. And so there are kiosks. If you haven't seen them, there's at least one in the PX. There are about a dozen total that are scattered about. We have one over at Denfos. But it's just a large touch screen for resources. There is one in here that's more of a desktop size touch screen for the same thing. Not everybody wants to engage a human being when they need something. My son gets online far quicker than he talks to us when he needs help. And so if that's your flavor too, we have those out and about around the post. And so the Fort Meade Alliance is, continues to help sponsor this sponsor this effort, but also the Fort Meade service members, family, retirees, veterans, and the like, to, in order to provide resources by hosting that URL. And the beauty, as Mr. Filano mentioned, is that we can continue to update it with whatever new information comes along. If there's just something else that we weren't tracking, we can add it, and this Coon Hall becomes our central beacon for that. So the other things that I wanted to hit on, just to make before we go to questions, to make sure to put some information out. Uh, HPCon, it is still a thing. So even though I won't be using the COVID word too often, uh, pandemic is still a, or pandemic too often, COVID is still a concern. Health in general is a concern. Our numbers have been on the rise, not to the point where we're ready to go to HPCon Bravo just yet. Uh, but it's only a matter of if we don't do the right things. This is about as close as I think I've been to anybody, you know, probably since I arrived, uh, other than trying to get in and out to a buffet line. But it's so much better with a larger audience and I get more laughs. There you go, staged. No, the, so with the HPCon, the numbers are rising because it's the holidays. There's just more exposure. People are traveling to areas they wouldn't normally. What I want to remind everyone else, besides looking out for the HPCon, stay home if you're sick, especially in so many different elements where we can do work, some kind of work from home. Stay home if you're sick. Now, if you aren't sure, and you know you absolutely need to be in, wear a mask. We are, no, we are well past that phase where wearing a mask looked completely out of place. And although we don't generally see it day to day, it's, it's no longer nearly as questionable and if someone, I am a general court martial convening authority on post, so if you wear an appropriate and approved mask in uniform and someone says no mask in uniform, you know, let's filter it back through the garrison command, GCMCA, and we can have a discussion. Uh, so I said appro approved because there are some masks we shouldn't be wearing in uniform. But wear a mask and stay home. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Some of the other things that are going on, of course, is it is the holiday season. That means a lot of things. It means that the winter weather is upon us. And for those that didn't get the message, we had our first winter weather call where I was up at midnight talking with the staff, decided to go ahead and do a late start today with the garrison services. Sure enough, then I got woken up at 3 o'clock when Anne Arundel County decided that the buses weren't going to run on time. The county was going to start late. And then I got another call about 4 o'clock when my wife's work called and said, hey, we're running late. Uh, first off, we need to streamline our internal SAP household communications. But more importantly is just be aware uh, that that's going to be out there. So if you know that some kind of winter event, weather event is coming up, be on the lookout for it. Facebook is our most reliable. I don't know if reliable is the right word, but it's our most consistent where we know no matter where we garrison staff are, we can get it on Facebook. We have the digital garrison app. Uh, 
MWR has their nice new sign that they're still working through because the resolution is, uh, the computer is not quite talking to the sign as much as we'd like. So right now we got to stick with big text for now, but we will be able to use that for some of the information too. Just be on the lookout and know that one organization's weather call does not necessarily mean another organization's going to do it. Kimbro falls under the OPM. So if the Office of Personnel Management says delay, then Kimbro will be on a delay. It doesn't matter what Garrison decides, two different entities. Generally, will they align? Probably, because if it's bad enough for one, it's probably bad enough for the rest of us. But just check exactly what you need, where you work, what service you're looking for, and how that may fall out when it affects you. The other piece with the holiday means that there won't be a lot of people around. For those that have travel plans, families that they want to go see, I wish you all the best, safe travels, enjoy the time because we absolutely need to reconnect sometimes and take a knee. But I also encourage you for, to remember that those who don't have uh, family to travel to or who may have family but are not necessarily close enough that that's something that's good for them. Sometimes we go see the family and we end up in a worse place when we come home. Just recognize that what's everything resilience, what works for you is not necessarily what works for your neighbor. So keep an eye out on your left and right. Look around the people. Uh, if you're a leader, take care of your subordinates. If you're a subordinate, know that sometimes your leaders need taken care of. Other things that have been posted on the Fort Meade Facebook page, we have the chapel services information posted. We have the, uh, I don't know how many children we have watching, but we do have a schedule. Santa is supposed to be in town, and the Fort Meade Fire Department has graciously offered him the biggest red sled that we, that we can provide. I hope they're using the red one and not the white one and make me look foolish. But, <laughs> But they will be bringing him around, and so that will also be posted. Yeah, actually, I think it already is on there. Excellent. So that is already on our Facebook, as well as a walkthrough video of the Resiliency Center so you can see what Coon Hall looks like, not just the wall behind us. We covered that, we covered that, and we covered that. So... One more plug before we look at, uh, well, two more plugs before we look at the uh, questions and answers that we have. One is for the listening and learning tour. I, I don't know if my public affairs was able to post this yet. It was just a JPEG image. It didn't look that great anyway. Uh, and and uh, my PAO and I were busy this morning with the BWI Business Partnership and spent the, most of the morning there. But Dr. Bedell, the superintendent for the Anne Arundel County Public Schools, is doing what he's calling the listening and learning tour. And, and that's absolutely what it, it is. Did it did get posted. Excellent. So if you have children that are in, in anywhere in the Anne Arundel County Public Schools, I encourage you to look at the Facebook page, find that image. There are about a dozen tours between now and January, or a dozen stops between now and January 11th. The one at Mead High was the second one on the list. And I will tell you as a parent, I found out the Friday, uh, that evening when I was looking at my email, and it was for Monday afternoon. So as a parent, I went. Uh, of course, as garrison commander, I also heard from one of the parents that this thing was happening, and so I went. Thank you for picking up that I was doing a little split personality there. And uh, I, I will tell you, Dr. Bedell is absolutely amazing. Uh, he is new to the county. He's got the right initiatives. He understands what it takes to get children into the schools and to take care of them as they, can t as, as they need to grow and develop. Uh, not just for an immediate. It's not just as a, uh, a way to watch kids so they're not home alone, but truly to grow them, develop them, and make them better for the community around us and the nation writ large. So he is open. He will give you his vision. If you attend these, and then he leaves a lot of time where they break out into small groups, five to six people. There's both staff from the county, the, the local schools, as well as parents, and they want to hear what you have to say. So I encourage you to attend that. The other is to understand the, uh, the retiree council. So 
I throw it out there because it is one of many ways. As I've said early on, connections is going to be a huge part of where I go for the next two years. Some of it's reestablishing connections. Some of it is recognizing that while we may have connections like a, uh, like a line and block chart, I want to create connections like a spider web and not like one of those nice pretty spider webs. It still has a lot of points, but I'm talking the orb that sits in the tree and you can't tell what's touching what because they're all a mesh working together. And that's where I think we need to be. So as I look at my consideration, my caring in the community, that's what I want to do. The Retiree Council is one of those opportunities that I have. It is part of the Fort Meade. We chair it as the garrison commander and uh, charter it. But to get people together to inform us of what we can do and then to get information from the installation so they can share it amongst their different networks as well. And so we had that. And uh, if you're out there, if you know a retiree who's not there, we need more members. You know, hit me up. We will get you the information, but also look for other opportunities where uh, we can do either council meetings or other local organizations, uh, non-federal entities, nonprofits. Some of them operate on base, some of them are exclusively off, but it doesn't mean we're not connected. And so I encourage that. Um, the last plug, the commissary has amazing sales. So I, I will uh, I'll say that I talked to my wife about it because we were using I don't know if it's Kroger, but we were using one of the DoorDash options. And I realized we're paying way too much. Now that I know the commissary has click to go, and, and it's all of, I think it's three minutes from my driveway to the commissary, uh, we're going to be saving some money uh, as we change our own spending habits too, especially after the holiday season. Okay, so I do have some pre-stage questions. I'll go through some of those. I'll do it fairly quickly. we got about half an hour now. Um, as I mentioned, we do have uh, several guests that are in here because we do have a little more room. And so if you hear a question come out of nowhere, that's what that's all about. So one of the first questions was, are the CYS CDCs implementing the 50% employee discount for the first child of direct care staff? Uh, a Shannon asked that question, and I feel like my staff may have staged it because the answer is, Yes, if you didn't hear, Fort Meade, no, seriously, we have a, there are, short, there are shortages in staffing everywhere. But with the child and youth services in particular, this is one of those issues where we, we can't do more with less. We hear that phrase every once in a while, especially in government services, you know, well, do more with less. Sorry, the hiring action's taking six months, cover down. Child and Youth Services is one of those where we are legally not allowed to do more with less. There are ratios that have to be met. There are numbers. It's almost like working with pilots. Uh, it's, it's frustrating how much we have to do the right thing legally in order to take care of children. But that means sometimes we just don't have the people to take care of the needs that are out there for the community. So they've been working, brainstorming different benefits, and I sell this to anybody that if you have ideas that either now or that you've been thinking of that are other uh, incentives that we can get for people working in the child and youth services, we are not just, when I say we, I'm talking at least up to the three-star level, people are interested in hearing those ideas. But the most recent initiative in Fort Meade is one of the lucky few installations, and there's about a dozen out of the 75 Army installations that gets this, that all of our CYS employees will have um, they have commissary privileges. So if you are not a DOD ID card holder, uh, military, uh, dependent, retiree, whatever it is, but if you don't have a military ID and you want to work in our CYS, you can still get commissary privileges. Use that click to go. And then the others is that there is a 50% fee reduction for your first child. So if you're a spouse out there uh, who's been wondering about it, but you've got one child, and it just doesn't make fiscal sense to take a job where now you have to pay for child care. First, the CDCs are already re uh, remarkably lower than anything off post, especially in the capital region. But second, your first child is a 50% wave uh, fee. And so that's a tremendous savings. Uh, there's a... Uh, 
tax-free shopping privileges at AFES, priority child, uh, priority child care placement. I, you know, I take that for granted, but that may not be assumed. The only people that have priority in their child placement over single military parents are CYS employees. Now, I will tell you I have dual military and single military parents that are still frustrated by that, and I understand. But I think if you step back, you can also recognize why that's important for us. Because one CYS employee, depending on the ratio, could take care of four or five or more children. Medical, dental, 401k, flexible work hours, or oh, that was the other. And then we now have recruitment bonuses. So uh, I've authorized a $200 recruitment bonus upon appointment and an $800 retention bonus, uh, it, specifically if you apply during any one of our CYS hiring fairs. And th those are out there. We're doing them almost once a month, the recruitment fairs. And more often than not, unless there's a facilities issue, we tend to do them off post at one of our correction. It's on post, but outside the fence line at the SAC building, or we, we try to be out there to where it, it doesn't have to be a installation access limitation. Okay, so the, wow, maybe, uh, maybe Fran did feed, because a, a lot of the questions were CYS focused. When will the CYS programs align with the current HPCon level alpha and adjust its hours for operations? This question's come up a few times. The levels of, the hours of operation for the CYS actually have nothing to do with HPCon directly. Uh, it is a manning and a funding limitation for the facility. When the Army first created the CDCs as a business model and started hiring staff, it was based on then, uh, I think it was actually nine hours a day. But there was one point where legally you couldn't have your child in childcare for more than 10 hours a day. And as time went on, of course, childcare centers, I was dual military, we were dual government, we played the game too, where we'd find a childcare center that opened for 11 hours a day, and then we would push the envelope, but their policy technically stated, if you dropped off at 6 a.m., you still had to pick up at 4 p.m because you were only supposed to keep your child in child care for 10 hours a day. And I'm sure there are a lot of legal reasons that make sense for that, but we never dug into it. But that's why our CYS program uh, has the hours that it does. So ultimately, it's not popular amongst the units, but because this installation is not your typical installation, that everybody's doing an hour and a half PT formations every morning, that I had made the decision that we weren't extending beyond the hours that we currently have, which is 11 hours a day, but that's why it goes right up against work hours and the PT hours. Someone else asked if, if there was a tentative date for reopening the teen center. The teen program is expected to reopen on 17 January. I will say I'm actually happy that the question was asked because it means that people are noticed that it was closed. Uh, that is one of the, uh, the first time I went through the teen center, even though this is my third time on the base, was as garrison commander about three months ago. Incredible center. If your kids are not already registered and going in, I'd have them stop by. They have, uh, they have a DJ station with a mixing board. They have 3D printers and classes there. They have, uh, it is part of the 4-H and the Big Brother Big Sisters uh, sponsorship. They have guinea pigs that they raise and uh, one of them likes to nibble a little bit. He can get a little tough, but uh, absolutely adorable. So if you have teens, I encourage them to get out there and check it out because the more throughput we have, the more we justify the expenses of keeping it open. But the reason we did have to close was staffing. So as we continue to work through that, we, we have a plan. Right now the plan is 17 January if everything continues to go as scheduled. Uh, okay, so we got a few others, but I do want to make sure we open it up to some of the people in here. If anybody's got a question already staged, you knew you were coming, so probably at least one or two. Please, our uh, tech sergeant. Yeah. We got a question. Uh, so, mine's regarding uh, potholes uh, and sidewalks. Um, and just wondering if, you, if there is a plan going forward for a particular third cavalry road, Troy Mountain uh, Road. So I 
know that I've seen them on I mean, some like the cast on the sidewalks, but some are like also the possible in this area that they can be addressed. And I'm looking at, for, well, I'm looking first to make sure. That, did you write down the address by chance? Third and twenty. Yeah, okay. I had to wear this uniform for the breakfast engagement, and I don't have my pen pocket, so <laughs> I cut you caught me short. But the, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so the the first part, uh, without knowing the exact spot, I suspect based on your description that it is part of the housing area. And that's one of the fascinating things, right? Is who, who gets to take care of which pieces of the road and sidewalk? There is part of we are in this as part of uh, 2022, and I don't remember if it was fiscal year, calendar year, but as as part of the past six months, Corvius did have a plan, and they had three steps of where they were knocking those out, and they said that they were going to complete by the end of December. What I don't know, and I can get back with Corvius, and, and there may be a rep from Housing or Corvius Online who's posting this on Facebook. That is the disadvantage to being in person is you don't see it, but is that uh, if they were ones that appeared after they had made the plan, then it actually ends up getting rolled up into the follow on years uh, work. So I, we can look into it specifically and we can actually get you a detailed answer, but know that yes, it, Corvius had a plan. They have achieved or they're on track to achieve the plan by the end of the calendar year. If it wasn't part of it and it's something that can be patched, they can do that sooner. Uh, one of the things that I, in fact, just learned last week is when it comes to roads, apparently there's only about a two or four year lifespan of a road that you can patch it before it does nothing and then you have to start subsurface. I think I remember the right term. That before you have to go to the subsurface and then clear that out like we did on Mapes Road. And then that gets you about another five to 10 years before you act to whatever that next level is. So uh, yes, we will check in on the specific one. I appreciate it. Behind you? Yes, ma'am. Hey, I actually posted this on Facebook as well. Uh, during the summer, the question of the RCP had come up, um, the Energy Conservation Program for housing. Um, there have been some suggestions that it was going to be reinstated. Uh, with no follow-on date, we've been told that we would be getting like periodic updates on that as part of your contract payments. Um, do you have anything that you can put out? Are there any updates, or is there somewhere that, as residents, we can go to get updates on that? Or is it kind of just we're going to find out through the mail <laughs> that they're reinstated? OK, I want to check and make sure I'm understanding the right one. You're are you talking about the, the utility payments? Or yes, so it's, okay. it's part of the R RUCP, the Resident Energy Conservation Program, and they suspended it a few years ago. Right. And it sounds weird because when I hear conservation, I know why they call it that. Yeah. Right, it's about the utility payments and when they take the averages. So as my, my Army housing chief reminds me that when that was first instituted, they actually saw that the energy use reduced, I think she said as much as 15%. Um, but it, it was above 10% reduction once, essentially once renters had to pay e or even had the chance of having to pay uh, utilities. It did result in conservation. That may be the intent. But as far as when it goes into action, we had a discussion, today's Thursday, it was on Monday or Tuesday, um, that I was meeting with Corvius, and, and there's still no date of when that goes in. And that's because it's ultimately not even a local Corvius decision. It is a broader privatized housing uh, concern. But as far as how you get notified, that's a good point because you want, you want to know. You want to be able to react. So I'll put on my, my green hat and say, it shouldn't matter. You should be trying to save electricity all you can. Now, I'll put on my renter hat and go, no, I want to know if there's a chance I have to pay out of pocket for something so I can adjust as needed. And uh, from that regard, I, do, I cannot imagine a scenario where you, you don't have at least a month notice where, hey, this month is the last free month, and then next month will be the first time we charge. So as far as getting the word out, flyer, email, if you're not on the Corvius distro, 
uh, we had a little bit of an argument in the SAP household because uh, my email, I almost said it out loud, uh, that's, which is probably not the greatest idea. My, my personal email is the one that Corvius has because I did all the paperwork. I don't read my personal email, and so my wife got upset when she said Corvius wasn't sending any updates, and I realized, oh, because I've been getting them for the last two months, three months. Uh, so I would say if you're not getting Corvius updates, please make sure that the, through their local centers that they have that. Uh, the Fort Meade Facebook page will give it. I love the page because everybody can get to Facebook, even if it's for us older folks and not everybody's using Facebook anymore, you can still get to it. What I don't like about Facebook is that it decides how things are prioritized. So it may be the most important thing to you, but you don't see it when you look at ours, even if we posted it two hours ago. So what I will say is it's one of those that when we get it out there, we will tag Corvius's page and then we can actually uh, pin it to make it a favorite post for a while because that'll be a, it'll be a significant change. Okay, and hold me to it. If you somehow find out in less than a month, hold me to that. <laughs> you like, say that. <laughs> no, no, I was just saying to you. No, 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 yeah. no. <laughs> Maybe everyone. Actually, I have one more question. Yes, and it had to do with the building. You had mentioned earlier that there were classrooms and everything open. Is, does that extend to dependents? Uh, so I think homeschool. Um, and I know there's a lot of groups, especially now during the winter, that are looking for spaces for their people, like homeschooling groups and things like that. Is that something, is that a group that could preserve the learning space for people? Or is this targeted more to the first level teachers? I have my answer, but I'll let my sneeze. Well, I, I was going to say I would have to defer to uh, Mr. Anderson. Well, <clears throat> with the rooms are, are mainly kind of set up for service members, so they can do like unit training uh, and for um, hopefully doing lunch. In the, in the upcoming months, we'll be able to do some type of college classes. Um, we, we have two rooms up there. Now, we could probably set up maybe that smaller room that holds maybe two to three people. It's like a, got a divided wall there. It's possibility of something like that, but the room, the bigger room that holds up to 18 people, that room is really designed for those type of meetings with units and training and this type of thing. Um, we do have in our B cell room. It's going to be we're we're shooting to have that room reserved for 15 working days every month because uh, that's designed for the service members, um, and that so it's it could be some possibilities, but it just it's one of those things where uh, first come, first serve, and definitely would be for the service members to set it up for that. To give more insight, as we talked about some of the 11 years worth of discussions, that actually at one point was one of the priorities. And there was, while I was a battalion commander, it was at Fort Gordon, Georgia. And I don't remember what the name of the facility was, but they had a building that was one of those that a family readiness group could reserve and that units could use for teaching families. It had a small little playground area. It had toys to help uh, with the uh, families while they brought in their kids so they could do a financial readiness class or have an FRG meeting and board discussion. And I know that that, had, that kind of concept had also been discussed here. Ultimately, as a space utilization was part of the limiting factor of why they didn't go there. Uh, the prioritization of, yes, so it needs to be a military a military priority, so we don't want to advertise it's open to everyone because in the end it would be a lot of disappointed people. And, and then the third factor was ultimately we put so much in here, now it's not a good facility to use as an overnight. It, because the one that I had seen at Fort Gordon, that's all it was, was essentially an empty building with some pamphlets that you would give the, someone the keys on Thursday afternoon and say, okay, Friday morning, bring it back. Because we put so much level into this, we don't, we can't just sign out a key overnight. So we are working with theirs. Um, in fact, it was at the Retiree Council a couple weeks ago this came up because there are employees. There are still federal employees who are both also retirees, or we have um, retirees who are Red Cross volunteers. And so that was one of the ideas in fact, I don't think I brought it up yet to either one of you when this came up. But uh, those were, someone had asked, well, if we had a vetted volunteers, where we know these four people 
could we use those volunteers in place of a government civilian being the facilities manager at that time? And I think there is opportunity for there. We just haven't worked it into the SOP. And the other good idea, I don't know if it's a good idea, but I think it is, that I'm sure is working with the USO and the likes to find, as an example, the post theater where it's, and this has come up a couple times, but where it's not showing Maverick and uh, it's been so long since I've been to the movies. I don't even know what's out right now, but uh, I need weekends back. But it's one of those that it's not showing the latest and greatest blockbuster that we have to charge 16 bucks a ticket for an old version of a theater, but that where we can do more family-oriented events and uh, especially we have a large homeschool population on this base. And so to give just an opportunity that uh, we could find the potential uh, revenue streams to match with uh, the support that could make that a volunteer option. Okay. Anyone else in the, in the galley? While you're thinking of your questions, uh, one of the questions came up from Dylan. When will the indoor basketball courts in Murphy Fieldhouse open back up? Uh, answer, we'll post on Facebook page. There you go, guys. No, for those that... Now, I'm going to give an answer, and we'll see if how close it is to the Facebook answer from the, the reps who have been dealing with this for many more years. One of the advantages of Murphy Fieldhouse is, is the idea of how it is this open court concept. Uh, I know that my predecessor had told me that, that was, the basketball court would come up once in a while. Uh, but Murphy gave us an opportunity to spread out some of the workout uh, options that we had. And then there's some other factors that we're trying to turn Murphy Fieldhouse into a 24-7 fitness center. So. Uh, you know, I guess I'm not going to give an answer specifically to the basketball court because there are nuances that could play in. But that's the longer-term vision that we would like to get Murphy Fieldhouse to a 24-7 workout. So then it's about the prioritization of space. If that's a 24-7 gym, does it make sense to have the court or have more weightlifting or cardio equipment there too? So I, it is on MWR's long-term plan. Yes. I'm looking. It was purely okay. I know why we haven't opened it is because it, well, as we had, I know why we haven't opened as much across. It's not just any one thing. It's staffing, but it was even staffing that got yes. us closed. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, a lot of us, that's a, a really big issue. That's the but they're making that their 24-7? Yeah. So oh, you're, okay. So there's a conflation of issues. The whole reason O'Brien hasn't been used lately uh, the, the one that's near Arby's, it was actually a gate construction issue. And so that's why they ended up having to make the other their primary. Uh, and so, yes, and that's what I was tracking is that they expected that to be done and back operational. Okay. I don't think that has been really pushed out. So I know there were a lot of people that were with the Rock and Rock. Oh, the, 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 uh, so they saw that there was more evening traffic out the Rockenbach and they were hoping that was a sign of good things to come? It's not. Sorry. <laughs> Any other? You shifted. That means a question, right? <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> okay. 
So I did uh, some other DES focused questions. Of the, um, Christina had asked about uh, traffic control 4 to 5 p.m. at the middle school. Four times I've almost been hit by an aggressive bus driver, not to mention the backup or out of Patriot Ridge Potomac Place housing. Place department can help with traffic control and buses need to follow traffic laws. Just because they're bigger doesn't give them the right of way. Uh, absolutely true. Uh, so, yes, we have police officers at major school zones to ensure the student's safety and returning from home. We're aware of the congestion. So that's the answer that we have pre-printed. That's not necessarily right to, for me to, and I get that, for me to say, yes, we have people there. And you see a problem doesn't mean you actually got what you want answered. What I would say is it's a little bit more than that because, and I'll, I'll need to look, we have two middle schools on base, right? We have Meade Middle and we have MacArthur Middle. I'm presuming this is an issue about MacArthur Middle, but I will talk to my emergency services to see if, uh, if this is a problem with the school spilling out onto the road or if this, if this is just an aggressive bus driver. Yeah, I'll dig into this, Christina, because it, it could be many things. As you probably know, part of the challenge is it's an Anne Arundel County property uh, on the school and so they have primacy for that location uh, but if there are bus drivers that are doing illegal dangerous activities all we have to do is get bus driver numbers and then we have the ability to communicate uh, they may not have the how's my driving 800 number but we do have uh, avenues where we can address that so please bring that up if that's a concern and uh, report that information to our non-emergency police force number. Oh, Amanda is, okay. No, I'm okay, because Amanda asked the same question about a 24, 7 oh. gate to Rock and Bach versus Mapes. Yep, we talked about that. Uh, and as far as Rock and Bach versus Mapes on 175 being the 24 seven, the bigger issue to understand, and right, it's hard depending on what time frame you've lived here, but Reese is our 24-7 gate. MAPES was never intended to be the 24-7 gate. Uh, with Reese versus Rockenbach, uh, the, the visitor centers there, um, the avenues, the high-speed approach, once someone gets in, they have more options than when if they come on the Rockenbach. You come into Rockenbach, there's some housing, but that only accounts for about 20% of the overall housing. Everything else is south of the post, and so you end up creating more traffic problems because you've changed, changed the flow of water and where it's going. Now, when Reese gets complete uh, sometime in the next 12 to 18 months, what that looks like, and if Reese goes back to being 24-7, or if it makes more sense for MAPES because of the expansion that we've already done, uh, that's something that we're actually going to have to do a traffic study and see that. And parallel parking on Parade Field Lane. Can those be marked off for individual car spacing to minimize parking? I thought those were individual cars. So, do any of you happen to know I what the question's about? I mean, they'd like to see some lines there. Are there not lines? No, not really, no. The, the spaces along the parade field. Okay. In front of the headquarters building. Yeah, just along the curves. Some right, we're talking about the customer parking right. that goes along Parade Field Lane. There's somebody wow, park how did I not notice there are no lines? They leave a lot of gap. Then right. They take another space. So, yeah, so, so we probably want to maximize. They have lines to be able to maximize the parking there. Because you have people do sometimes leave extra space you can't get a car into. No, that's a good point. So I, I asked, uh, I, when one of the first things I got, because we have, and the question didn't come up in this form per se about this, but it comes up a lot in our ICE comments, is a concern about that parking because building 4550 is meant to be a customer service building uh, oriented. It's got the recruiting command in there, we have, but we have the one-stop shop where everybody's coming through it in process, out process, and there are other factors that's used. So... That's one battle that I've been having is making sure our employees understand why we don't park in that lane. Now, I mean, if there are handicap exceptions, uh, we definitely entertain that. 
But for the most part, we're pushing people to park towards the post office parking lot and on this side of the road to free those up for customers. When I had that discussion with our resource manager, I found out that there was a study done in how they could optimize those parking spaces over the years. So I hadn't asked the question about lanes specifically. So I will say first, I will go back uh, to my resource manager and ask the question if that was a deliberate, because it's like Southwest, sometimes just letting the flow go actually ends up creating more efficiencies and trying to establish the procedure. But if it wasn't a deliberate decision and the next step is, is that part of our repainting effort that we have scheduled to do in this year? And this year being the fiscal year, not the calendar year, so nine months from now. Okay. And that was also from Amanda. Thank you. Any other questions on uh, Facebook? Any others? Yeah, please. You have a question about resiliency. Uh, that's the especially the services here. Um, that's for all ser all uh, service members. Therefore, anyone can come here to receive uh, like resiliency type services. Is that what it's intended for? Or is it just the Army um, R two uh, program that you may have spoken to? I feel like you may have that, yeah. That before, and I, I, I almost feel like that was a staged question too, because. One, I can answer it, and two, it's exactly the talking point we want to reemphasize. No, it is absolute whole service. Uh, it is all six of you services out there, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, Space Force. I don't know if that's the right order of precedence. I apologize if not. But it's, at the, uh, it's for retirees. It's for veterans. It's for family members, dependents. So it, it really is meant to, to be an opportunity because ultimately there is at least one program it is applicable to each, uh, each population type out there. And as it brought up earlier, you don't know until you ask the question and find out. So that's what we really want to get to. Help you, help you, the broader community, sift through the tsunami of information that's out there to find what it is you need when you need it. I'll take one more. Yep, and then we'll... Great question. Uh, and the, the answer is they can't always make finding referrals. Uh, if it's uh, not uh, a matter of crisis, uh, they, they don't make finding referrals. If it's a matter of crisis, then, uh, then they can uh, do something uh, a little stronger with that. But one of the things they can't do, uh, which for some is an advantage, is they can't tell your command that you need to command refer someone. Uh, which, right, to some, that's an advantage unless it is a threat to life or threat to self or others. But for commanders, of course, it's a little frustrating. But the key thing I would say, if there's any leaders that get frustrated when they hear that, recognize better to get the help they need uh, than to wait until we have a bigger problem. So uh, I appreciate everybody's time. We hit the magical hour, and I, I thank you. Out there, if you happen to dial in, I don't know how, I can't wait to see how good the connection was for my own loved ones. We're going to be posting it tomorrow. We'll be posting it tomorrow. <laughs> so for those that had no clue because you waited till tomorrow to read it, uh, everything went, or watch it, everything went fine. And, but I appreciate your time and attendance. And for those who came out to see us today, uh, please stick around for a little bit. And we will continue to find ways that we can get out and have other representatives of the installation. There is so much to offer here. And in the end, it really is all about connections with partners. So thank you all. Have a great day.